Hello students, this video and the ones that are to follow are all going to be covering the material from chapter 9 and chapter 10. So let's go ahead and get started. As usual, take notes and um, this, uh, especially for this material, uh, especially, well, actually both chapters 9 and chapter 10, it's going to be very important that you learn to do the techniques that I'm giving on this video. Part of what I'm going to be testing you on is your technique on how you get your right answers. With everything being take-home exams from here on, I can't just ask you to draw a Lewis structure or, um, you know, a Vesper model or something because everybody can just Google it, okay? So um, part of what I'm going to be testing you on is how you get to your answers. So it's going to be essential that you do things the way that I'm teaching you. I will be grading you based on doing it the same way that I am teaching it. So that's something that's a little bit different um, with these chapters, but even more of a reason to take some really good notes. Okay, so let's get started by, let me, um, let me say it like this, chapters 9 and 10 change my marker. Chapters 9 and 10 are, in my, in my mind, kind of get combined into one. They, they um, both kind of deal with the same thing. Chapters 9 and 10 deal with um, th theories regarding chemical bonding. All right, so we're at the point in our understanding of chemistry where we're going to start to take compounds, molecules, and um, learn about what type of bonds they form, but specifically why um, they form certain types of bonds. And we're going to not only be looking at ionic versus covalent, but even within covalent, we're going to start to learn about single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, um, bond angles, really getting into being able to, able to analyze molecules like it, um, and be able to understand what they look like, even though obviously you can't see them with your, with your eyes. Um, we're actually going to be learning three different theories of chemical bonding, and, and this is mostly, um, at least for now, an introduction on the theories, and then this video will get into the first theory. So the first theory that we're going to be learning is called Lewis theory. Lewis theory. And I want to kind of make this really clear. This is the first theory that pretty much everybody uses when they attempt to analyze a molecule. You're always going to start with what's called Lewis theory. And like I said, we will be getting into this a lot today. Um, the second theory, and let me go ahead and just outline this first. Once you apply what's called Lewis theory, the second theory that, you're gonna, that we're going to learn to apply to a molecule is called Vesper theory. Vesper theory. And the third theory, I'm trying to make this clear, they actually go in order. You always start with this one, then apply this one, and then you will then apply a, a third theory called the valence bond theory. All right, so first thing is that we have these three different theories that scientists use to understand molecules. Let's go ahead and talk about what are they, what kind of things do they tell us. So, Lewis theory. Lewis theory will describe um, the type and placement of bonds in a molecule. So Lewis theory is going to be able to help us understand um, are we having ionic bonds or covalent bonds? But even within covalent, are we having single, double, triple bonds? And what type of atoms are they between? That's what we mean by placement. Which atoms are the bonds between? So for all of these, let me illustrate using um, water, H2O, the most famous molecule in the world. With Lewis theory, I'm going to be teaching you, this is all introduction, I'm going to be teaching you how to draw what's called a Lewis structure. And let me just get to the end of it here, the end result. Obviously, I'll be teaching you this today. The Lewis structure for H2O is this, and I'll be teaching you how to know that today in the video. 
But essentially, Lewis theory gets us to this point in our understanding of the molecule. What we will, can learn from Lewis theory is that there are single bonds between the H's and the O. On, um, so I'm just writing SB for now, but that just means single bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms. And also, these little double dots here, we're going to learn that those are called lone pairs. And that's actually something also that Lewis theory will help us to understand. Where are the, where are the, um, the lone pairs? Where are the bonds? What type of bonds are they? But that's as far as Lewis theory takes us, okay? Now, when we are able to learn about what type of bonds hold the molecule together and where they are, we can then just we can then apply a, a like a, a little bit more complex theory. Um, these all increase in complexity, by the way. As you um, move from this to this to this, you get more and more complex, but also you you get more and more detailed about what you know about the molecule. So, what does Vesper theory describe? Vesper theory describes the bond angles and thus the shape of the molecule. Once we learn Vesper theory, which is going to come in chapter 10, we then can understand a little bit more about the H2O molecule. And that is the shape of it and the bond angles. And let me go ahead and draw what the end result is going to end up being. All right, that's going to be our Vesper theory. We will end up learning that. And the bond angle is going to be less than, less than 109.5 degrees. That's the bond angle. And the shape of the molecule, we will learn, is called bent. That information is only learned through Vesper theory, not through Lewis theory. Okay, that's Vesper theory. It's, it deals with bond angles and shapes. So that's going to be coming in Chapter 10. After you apply this theory, there's still one more thing that we can learn about a molecule, um, and that is called, uh, that is going to be found out through applying what's called valence bond theory. Valence bond theory will end up describing, or let me write where it describes the type of orbitals used for bonding. So, um, by the way, notice that I didn't lose any information. I still have my lone pairs, but I added this idea of the angles when I applied Vesper theory. In the same way with valence bond theory, I'm going to have keep all the same information about shape, but now I'm going to be able to understand what type of orbitals um, are used for bonding. And what I'll be able to learn is that oxygen is using what are called sp3. hybrid orbitals, and the hydrogen is using S orbitals. And that, I'm just going to draw double dots here, and it, this will all come to, to be learned in due time. Um, that is where valence bond theory can help me out. It's going to help me understand what type of orbitals the, um, the atoms are using for bonding. Now, there's still more to learn after all of this, but this is really where Chem 101 will, be, will end after we have an understanding or an appreciation of, what, of these three theories. And you can really learn a lot about a molecule um, by applying and learning how to use these theories on the molecules. So that's just a brief introduction, and let me make sure I highlight key points. Type and placement of bonds for Lewis, shape, and actually bond angles for Vesper, and orbitals for valence bond theory. Those are like the, the key things um, that each theory explores. All right, so let's get into just Lewis theory today. And by the way, as I'm erasing, the, another concept, um, molecular polarity, 
is going to be able to be learned after we learn these principles. You know, is a certain molecule polar or not polar? That's going to be something that we're going to be able to learn as well. Alrighty, so let's get into Lewis theory. How do we use Lewis theory? How do we apply it? And by the way, notice the, the wording theory, okay? None of these are 100% um, true, okay? Theories are our best understanding of things that we cannot see um, based on data. And there is data to support all of these theories, but none of them are perfect. And you'll even see, I'll, we'll talk about um, different ways that we fix the theories or adjust the theories to kind of fit the data. So that's going to be um, kind of a, a theme with all of this. You kind of have to just accept the fact that it's our best understanding apply to really small things that we cannot see. And that's why we call them theories. It's not like Boyle's Law or Charles Law, which is proven fact um, based on data. It's not, it's not the same. Okay, Lewis theory. So in Lewis theory, essentially what you're doing to apply Lewis theory is we draw what are called Lewis Sometimes um, they'll add the words electron dot, but sometimes they just say Lewis structures to represent atoms or molecules. So when you're using Lewis theory, essentially what you're doing is drawing Lewis structures for atoms or molecules. So let's talk about what is a Lewis structure. It's quite simple, actually. A Lewis structure um, is a um, drawing of the molecule where each dot represents one valence electron. One valence electron. This is really important that whenever you are dealing with Lewis structures, you are fixated on valence electrons. And remember that when it comes to um, when it comes to your periodic table, I just have a, a copy of it here. You will be able to tell the number of valence electrons based on the group number. So, for instance, lithium has one valence electron because it's in group 1A, whereas aluminum has three valence electrons because it's in group 3. Oxygen has six valence electrons because it's in group 6, and um, so on and so on. And you could say neon has eight valence electrons because it's in group 8. So you're looking at the group number. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with just Lewis structures for atoms. If all that we need to do is draw a Lewis structure for an atom, which is, by the way, not going to be that common of a request because Lewis theory is designed to help you understand molecules, but let's start on the ground floor. If all you're asked to do is draw a Lewis structure for an atom, it's very simple. You just write, let's do hydrogen. You just write the um, element symbol. You count how many, you find out how many valence electrons that atom has. Hydrogen has one. And you put the, the one dot, because it only has one valence electron, in either a north, south, east, or west position. Um, it doesn't matter where you put it. There's no preference. I'll go ahead and put mine here. But had you put yours up top, it would have been perfectly acceptable. Let's go ahead and do several more. How about, let's say, aluminum. Aluminum has three valence electrons. And so you're going to need three dots. Now, when you have multiple dots, you are going to put them in um, separate positions before doubling up, kind of like the Huns rule concept. So one, two, three. But just understand, if you had you put them in these positions, one, two, three, that also would have been fine. Um, carbon. Carbon has four valence electrons. One, two, three, four. Let's do several more. How about we do oxygen? Oxygen has six valence electrons. Um, one, two, just start anywhere you want. I started in the north, but it's fine. You start anywhere you want as long as you fill them up singly before you double up. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And notice how I did my double dots. They will be on kind of as if picture a box. 
that's how you would align them. Like on the top, you'd be, they'd be horizontal to each other. On the side, they'd be vertical to each other. So that's oxygen. Um, maybe you get the point. Let's just go ahead and do, let's just go ahead and do, how about argon? Argon. Argon has, it's a noble gas that has eight valence electrons. And as you're filling them up, five, six, seven, eight. And that would be how you would draw the argon atom. Okay, so that's how you just do um, Lewis structures for atoms. Not, not anything majorly um, exciting there. All right, now let's get into Lewis structures for molecules. And this is where the, um, the theory becomes useful when we're, when we're analyzing molecules. Before we go ahead and do um, some, some examples, let me make a key point about Lewis theory. The key point here is this, that we need to understand is this. Um, bonds are formed okay so chemical bonds are formed for a purpose they are formed in order to lower the energy of the two atoms okay understand when you have say a hydrogen atom and then another hydrogen atom. Without getting into Lewis theory too much right now, why does it form H2? We know that it forms H2, but why? Why does it even form H2? The whole point of forming a bond, and this is true universally for every molecule, is that when the atoms are alone by themselves, they're high energy. High energy meaning unstable. Their energetics, their protons and electrons, all the interactions are unstable. But when they're allowed to form a bond, without getting into the reasons yet, um, the, the reason that bond formed was so that the atoms themselves could become, both of them would end up being lower energy, more stable, and that's why it happened. If it didn't help the atoms to become more stable, that bond would have never have happened. So it's only for a purpose, to lower the energy of both atoms. Now, so bonds are formed in order to lower the, en the energy of the two atoms. Now, here's what we have to keep in mind. Atoms are happy. And I, when I say happy, I'm saying, I'm, what I mean is low energy or stable. When they have a full valence shell or valence orbitals. All right, we talked about this a little bit before, but for instance, hydrogen, okay? Hydrogen by itself has, as we know from review, a 1s1 um, electron configuration, 1s1. It is not stable in this situation. And by the way, this is his valence orbitals, the 1s. He is stable when he is full, meaning when he gets two. So what we just discovered is that hydrogen is happy with two electrons, which by the way is called um, a duet, a duet. In um, chemistry, we call that a duet. The, the two that kind of complete your valence shell. Let's go ahead and talk about pretty much all other, and that's, by the way, that's somewhat true for um, like lithium, for instance, beryllium. Those are happy also just by having that, that 1s orbital filled. Um, and by the way, helium is filled, which is why, let, let me say that, helium's electron configuration is 1s2, which is why helium is happy as is. He doesn't form bonds with anybody because he doesn't need to because he's already stable. He's already full. But, um, and that's true for some, well, yeah. Let me move on. So, however, let's look at almost all other atoms on your periodic table. 
So something like, um, let's pick carbon. Carbon. Carbon's electron configuration, let me do electron configuration, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. He has six total electrons, four of which are valence. When the carbon atom is alone, he is not stable. He is not full in his valence shell. He has only four. What would make him full? He would need to have a 2p6 right here, giving him a total of eight valence electrons. And what you'll find is that's true for pretty much every other atom. We'll look at one more together, but that's true for pretty much every other atom. So he needs eight, and this is what's called an octet. For almost all other atoms, they are happy when they get what's called an octet. The octet, or the eight valence electrons in their outer valence orbitals, makes them stable. That's the whole concept of noble gas envy. That's why they want to have that same electron configuration as the nearest noble gas. So we've kind of already seen this before. Um, let's go ahead and just for the sake of convincing, take something like um, bromine, okay? Bromine. Bromine's electron configuration, um, I, I didn't teach you how to do the noble gas abbreviation method um, because I didn't want you to use it in the last test, but we can use it now, I guess. So if you just take the previous noble gas argon with the brackets, and just continue on reading your periodic table from that point. It's, it's a way to shortcut your um, electron configuration if you want to save time. So 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. Okay, this is just bromine's electron configuration. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's fine. Just write it. You could always write the long one yourself. It's fine. But this is where it ends. Okay, where are his valence electrons? His valence electrons are... For main group elements, the ones in the highest principal quantum number, so these ones, he has 7, 2 plus 5 is 7, consistent with the fact that he's 7a on the periodic table in his group number. Once again, by himself, the bromine atom is not happy, okay, because he only has 7 valence electrons. He wants 8. 8 will make him full. An extra one will make him full. 4s2, 4p6 would be full. So like I said, almost all other atoms besides hydrogen, helium, lithium, those ones want eight. I'm saying almost because there's a couple little exceptions here and there, but I don't want to fixate on the exceptions. So everybody else but hydrogen, think octet. Hydrogen, think duet. Okay, that's what makes them happy. So now let's kind of, now that we've addressed that, Let's get into some molecules. And what I, what I want to do is I want to start with um, ionic compounds. Um, so let's deal with ionic compounds first. So let me just write this in person. Um, ionic compounds. You can use Lewis theory to understand ionic compounds. And sometimes this is a, just that last thing that people need to really understand chemistry in terms of um, forming ionic compounds. But it's not really the sweet spot for Lewis theory, so you'll see it's kind of, um, it, Lewis theory becomes much more compelling and helpful with covalent bonding. But let's go ahead and talk ionic compounds first. Let's go ahead and pick a, just a really simple ionic compound, something like KCl. Uh, potassium chloride. Let's go ahead and apply Lewis theory to it. I want to apply Lewis theory. So... We have KCl. Let's talk about the atoms and se let's separate them first. Okay, so we've got K and we've got Cl. Um, let's draw their Lewis structure. So K has one valence electron because it's in group one. Chlorine has seven valence electrons because it's in group seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I did make my single one kind of facing towards the other atom just for the ease of a drawing, to be honest, but that's not necessarily required. Okay, so now let's go ahead and analyze when these two atoms are separated, like in two different beakers, obviously they can't react, but you now put them near each other. They can 
exchange electrons. They can share them or transfer them, but some, something is available to them now to interact with each other because they're near each other. Okay, what, here's the, what you have to understand. The, whatever bond helps both of them be happy is the bond that's going to form. It's like a business deal. A business deal does not go through until both parties are satisfied with it. It's the same thing with atoms. What will cause both of these atoms to be satisfied or have the octet that they both want? Well, let's just make sure you're getting this whole thing. Potassium's electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. Okay? Potassium's electron configuration. That is the valence electron. This is that. Understand that if he can just lose that valence electron, just lose it, then he has his outer valence orbitals filled because his, his valence orbitals are now the, the three level and he has eight. That will make him stable. So he's going to be happy to lose one. Chlorine is the exact opposite. Chlorine is going to be happy to gain one. Chlorine's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. He has seven, but if he can just add one more, he will get full. As long as he gets the plus one, he'll have eight. So by potassium transferring his electron to chlorine, both atoms become happy satisfied or low energy, and that's exactly what happens with this molecule. There is a transfer of one electron from potassium to chlorine, and that ends up creating the following situation. So here is what, if someone asked you to draw the Lewis structure for this molecule, this is what you would be drawing, the Lewis structure. Potassium, when he loses that electron, becomes the K plus anion. Okay, sorry, K plus cation. He is now positively charged because he still has all of his protons, um, 19 protons, but he now only has 18 electrons. So that gives him a plus one charge. And then chlorine now has eight electrons in his valence shell. Now, we have to make sure that we represent chlorine as the negative anion that he is. But because negatives and dots look very similar, especially to people that don't have nice handwriting, whenever you have dots and a charge outside, you have to enclose him, that species, in brackets to separate the dots from the negative. That is the Lewis structure for KCl. Okay, now let's go ahead and do at least two more of these just to make sure we see it. And then we're going to get into molecular compounds, which have covalent bonds. That's a little bit more um, uh, useful. Let's go ahead and do, do something like um, lithium sulfide. Lithium sulfide. That's another uh, ionic compound, and I know that because we got a metal and a non-metal. Okay, this time we have two lithium atoms. Both of those have one valence electron, so I'm just kind of setting the table, and we have a sulfur uh, sulfur has six valence electrons. All right, same concept. What needs to happen between these species to get everybody satisfied? Lithium is going to be very happy to lose that last electron. Remember, lithium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s1. Right now, he's very unstable because he's not full in his valence shell. But if his, that electron leaves, he's now got that stable duet that hydrogen has, or sorry, that helium has. So he will transfer his um, electron to, to the other atom, in which case uh, is sulfur in this case. And you have a second lithium that will do the exact same thing. Um, but you only needed one sulfur atom to accept both because sulfur has two spots. Um, available on his way to trying to get his octet. So now that transfer, both lithiums to the sulfur atom, 
or the electrons from both lithiums to the sulfur atom makes everybody happy, gives everybody that stable electron configuration. Now, how do you draw the Lewis structure? Um, you would just say, you would have to say this, 2Li plus. You would use a 2 right there to indicate that you have two lithium cations. And then enclosed in brackets, you would have your sulfide anion with his charge outside, 2 minus. All right, and that is how you would draw the Lewis structure for that compound, just like that. Let's go ahead and do one more. How about, um, how about something like um, aluminum oxide? Aluminum oxide, another ionic compound. Okay, a lot of atoms going on here. We've got five atoms, two aluminum atoms. Let's start with them. Aluminum has three valence electrons. Okay, very unstable if the atom's by itself. It's not nowhere near full. Um, by the way, before I continue on, let me make this point. Uh, aluminum, to get full, would either have to gain five or lose three. It is easier to lose three than to gain five, okay? And that's why aluminum forms a cation. That's why these are metals that form cations. Um, and by the way, they will, that's why they will only do it when they have, uh, when they're in the presence of nonmetals, because you have to have someone to give the electrons to, okay? So hopefully this is all kind of, when you look at it a different way, it actually chemistry makes so much sense. Let me go ahead and do um, oxygen. Oxygen is six valence electrons. So I've got three oxygen atoms. And I'll just draw them all the exact same way. Okay, what needs to happen when this molecule, for this molecule to form? Well, aluminum's gotta lose the three valence electrons and you can give one of them to him, one of them to him, but then this oxygen is now satisfied. He has his eight. So now we're gonna have to start depositing it to this oxygen. That satisfies oxygen number two. And now we can satisfy oxygen number three. Now, can you see, this is another way of thinking about chemistry, why it took two aluminum atoms to satisfy three oxygen atoms. It's another way of thinking about the subscripts that you can you can use in your understanding of chemistry. But real quick, how do we draw that Lewis structure? Oops. How do we draw the Lewis structure? It would be, you have two aluminum cations, no dots anymore, because now that you've lost those dots, their valence shell is full. In fact, aluminum's now ends with 2s2, 2p6, but you don't refill them in with dots. You just kind of accept that it, what used to be there is gone. Okay, so you don't draw any new dots. Um, and then we have three of the oxygen. So you're just gonna use these big numbers or these coefficients to indicate the number of the, the species. And what would the oxygen's charge be? Well, two new electrons that didn't used to be there, that's an O2 minus, just, just consistent with everything we've always known about ions and ionic compounds. So that's how you would do the Lewis structure for Al2O3. Okay, moving on to really the, the heart of Lewis theory, though, is, is not really, in my opinion, ionic compounds. It's kind of helpful, and it's kind of neat to see it from that point of view. But um, really where Lewis theory is especially helpful is in understanding covalent bonding. Covalent bonding is something we have not done a whole lot of, but this is where we start to do a lot of it. So Lewis structures for molecular compounds, and we've always known for a long time that molecular compounds are the ones that utilize covalent bonds. Covalent bonds. Okay, so we will start out with a very simple molecule, F2. F2 is certainly a molecular compound because it's made up of two nonmetals. They're both fluorines, but they're, they're still it's, it's nonmetals. So let's take a look at how this works. And by the way, 
as I'm teaching Lewis theory, I always start teaching at very bottom floor, very fundamental so that you understand what you are doing when you're drawing a Lewis structure. However, by the end of this video, I am going to give you a more methodical way to draw Lewis structures that is preferred, that is going to be required. Um, so really, trust me, you want to do this exactly like me. Start out by thinking about just the atoms and making sure you understand what a covalent bond is, why do they form, and all that. But once I get to the methodology that I put on the board and I give you steps, I want you to follow that on the test. Part of what I will be grading you on is did you follow it exactly to a T? Um, it's for your own good, and it's also a way for me to prove that people are not just outsourcing these exams um, to other people or just Googling stuff. Okay, so it's, it's a way to prove your mastery of a concept. Okay, so um, fluorine, F2. So you have a fluorine atom. Let's go ahead and draw... How many dots? Remember, even though, let me be real careful with this. Fluorine is what atomic number? Fluorine is atomic number nine. That means he has nine total electrons. Well, remember, it's protons, really, but the fluorine atom would have nine electrons. But be careful. In Lewis theory, the dots are only the valence electrons, valence only. So this number is not what you want. You want the group number. You want seven. He has seven valence electrons. See, of those nine, two of them are core. Two of them are core. And those don't appear at all on the Lewis structure. So we want the number seven. So we need seven dots. One, two, three, four. Now, I'm drawing another fluorine over here. So I'm going to make the single one on the inside. But understand, you do fill them up one at a time, OK? Let me draw the other fluorine here. Oops, let me be, let me be good here. Let me fill them up one at a time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like I said, I'm putting the singles towards the middle just for a nice picture. Okay, now, understanding. By themselves, the two fluorine atoms are very unhappy. They do not have the octet that they want. Will a transfer be useful here, okay? Kind of like when we, we, we did before, where we kind of put, take one electron from the one and give it to the other guy. The answer is no. A transfer would be happy. It would make him happy, but it wouldn't do nothing for him. That's not going to help him. Okay? And remember, unless both atoms become happy through the deal, through the bond, then it doesn't form. It has to lower the energy of both atoms for it to be like a, a good deal, for it to happen. So instead of a transfer, what the atoms do is they, what they do is they share these two electrons. And so the way that we would represent that Lewis structure would be like this. The single electron in, with him will, um, and the one from him will essentially live in the, what's called the intranuclear space, intranuclear space, the space between both nuclei. Those will kind of occupy that area and the two atoms will share them. Now here's the, here's the, the thing about the, um, the shared electrons. Well, there are several things. More often than not, and in fact, this is not really how most grown-up chemists would do it, the shared electrons are represented with a dash. So if I was to ask you to draw the Lewis structure for F2, that's really what I'm looking for, that guy. The shared electrons are represented with a dash, OK? Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing I want to say, let me put several points on this, because there's several things to lay out right in front, and then we can kind of move a little bit faster. Let me write key points. Let me reiterate that core electrons are not depicted in a Lewis structure. You will never see the core electrons. Valence electrons only. That's a huge point, because that can mess you up. Um, I also want to make a point that in a molecule, in a molecule, 
all the elect all the valence electrons exist in pairs. The more you do of these, the more you'll notice it. But it's true. They're always paired up in a molecule, sets of two. Okay? You'll see that the more that you do. They're always existing in pairs. That's going to be important for us in a little bit. Another point I would like to contrast is lone pairs versus bonding pairs. So for the sake of my um, board, let me abbreviate lone pairs LP and bonding pairs BP. On a Lewis structure, so I said that this is the correct Lewis structure for here, pairs that are on a single atom, like this one here, these are what we call lone pairs. That's a lone pair, a lone pair, because it, ex it exists on one atom alone. So this Lewis structure, the molecule, has six lone pairs, one, two, three, four, five, six. Whereas this pair right there, that's called a bonding pair. Bonding pairs are the ones that live in the intranuclear space and are shared between both atoms. Okay, so bonding pairs versus lone pairs. Um, the most important thing I want to write here, so I guess you could call it point number five. Let me get some space here. Point number five. The shared electrons count towards the octet or the duet. So we will look at hydrogen just a little bit for both atoms. This is not necessarily common sense because in our concept of sharing, if I have a Twix bar and I share it with my son, I will get one and he will get the other, okay? That's not how atoms share. When atoms share electrons, they both get both. And so why are they happy? Well, left fluorine has two, four, six, eight, an octet. And right fluorine has two, four, six, eight, an octet. So that's why they're both happy. It's not that you have to split it in half. They both get both electrons that are in the middle. Okay, so that's the whole concept of a covalent bond. It's a way to satisfy both atoms by leaving the electrons in the intranuclear space um, and basically satisfying or lowering the energy of both atoms. Now, getting into single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds. To teach this, I always do three molecules, H2, O2, and N2. Alrighty? These are three um, of your diatomic elements, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Let's go ahead and use Lewis theory to look at the type of bonding that exists in each of these. And you might learn something you didn't know about these molecules. All right, hydrogen. Hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms. Obviously, that, that's what the two means. There's two hydrogen atoms. So let me draw one, let me draw the other. And we know that hydrogen has one valence electron, which is why I drew each of them with one dot. A transfer, not gonna help us here because that would maybe satisfy one hydrogen but leave the other one without an electron. Uh, and it, they both want a duet. Remember, hydrogen wants to fill up his 1s orbital. So by sharing these two electrons, and let me just jump straight to the dash rather than having the two dots in the middle. By sharing those two electrons, both atoms are satisfied. And that is all that you need to make a molecule. You've satisfied both atoms with the electrons that you have. Okay, so that is um, the, the Lewis structure for, for H2. That's all that it is, H dash dash H. This bond right here, when you have just one dash, is called a single bond, a single bond. A single bond represents two shared electrons, one from one atom, one from the other atom, two shared electrons. Let's move on to oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons. One, two, three, four. Now, for the sake of my drawing, I'm going to double these two up and leave these two single. 
And here's the other oxygen atom, same situation. Okay, so I'll, you know, you do fill them up one at a time, but you can, you can choose where you start doubling up, okay? So when these two atoms are separate, nobody's happy. They need their octet. What they realize is that if they can just share these electrons, this set and this set, they will, let me show you this one with the dots. Okay, so the first set would look like this, and the second set would look like that, okay? That is what you call a double bond. So let me go ahead and show you. Normally, um, kind of the mature way of writing it would be like this. And that's how I would want you to write it if asked on an exam. I want you to use the dashes. That's what everybody uses. This here is called a double bond. And I'm not even going to write it, but it represents two pairs of shared electrons. Two pairs of shared electrons. Um, what I do want to tell you about double bonds is this. Double bonds are stronger and shorter than single bonds. Picture having two pieces of tape holding a gift wrap together. It's going to be stronger, just like um, two bonds. And then in addition, the, the double bond will literally draw the two atoms ever so slightly closer together than a single bond would have. So they are shorter bonds than single bonds. So stronger and shorter. Let's move on to N2. Nitrogen, two nitrogen atoms. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. And as I fill them up, I am going to have, so there's one at a time. I'm going to put my last one here on the outside. And same here, I'm going to put my last one on the outside just for the sake of a nice picture. And you can see that separated, or neither of them have an octet. But if they can share some sets of electrons, that pair, that pair, and that pair, they will have um, the octet that satisfies both atoms. And I drew three lines because it's three shared pairs of electrons. Okay, so I drew a happy face for here. Let me make sure I draw my happy faces. I mean, not that you need to draw happy faces, but it's a reminder that the, the whole point is make the atoms happy. Get them their octets. Or if it's hydrogen, get it, it's duet. Okay. Um, this here, as you certainly can figure out yourself, is called a triple bond. A triple bond being um, three pairs of shared electrons in the intranuclear space. And using your common sense, it is the strongest and shortest type of covalent bond. There is no um, quadruple bond, okay? So triple is where the possibilities end. So understanding single, double, triple bonds. And how do you know when you have what? Well, it just all depends on what two atoms are trying to, to make a bond. Now, moving forward. Okay, moving forward. Um, when you are asked to draw a Lewis structure for a molecule, the method that I've been showing, where you draw the two atoms separately and just look for sharing, is not the method that I want you to use. It's not really the method that most people use. It's a good method to explain what covalent bonding is. But in terms of a go-to method to draw Lewis structures, that is not what I'm going to be requiring of you on the test. Instead, I want you to use the method that I'm going to teach you on the board here. Number one, it's way more foolproof. Um, you will not make mistakes on your Lewis structures if you use this method. There are certain things that you might not see 
if you try to do the other method. And the problem is a lot of teachers in high schools or maybe other colleges or whatever, don't give their students hard Lewis structures. So it's very easy for them to see it with the, with, the, what, with what I just showed you. But that's gonna hit a brick wall. You have to trust me on this. That's gonna end up causing you problems if you rely on looking at the atoms as single units and thinking about what they bring to the table. So not to mention the fact that I'm gonna require you to use this method on the test showing me the, the individual steps to get full credit. So let me go ahead and um, I'll even give you the steps. Okay, there's six steps and I'll write them on the board and we'll use plenty of examples to teach it. So let me go ahead and put this, uh, let me go ahead and do this here, the steps for drawing Lewis structures for any molecule. All right, so this is your go tool, go to foolproof method, foolproof method. And we're going to be using, um, th these are all molecules. I'm not going to be asking for this methodology. It's not um, going to be ionic compounds. Ionic compounds we've dealt with and, and we're done with ionic compounds. This is molecules where you have covalent bonding. Let me go ahead and just use um, a uh, example. So let's go ahead and do NF3. All right, so we're going to be doing a Lewis structure for NF3, and I'll take you through the steps in order. All right, number one, first step, arrange the atoms. on your paper. And here's the thing. Um, you want to use like, um, don't be scatterbrained about how you, you want to be neat with your Lewis structure, okay? So what you have to do is you have to figure out what is the central atom, and then you want to put the other atoms on like a north, south, east, west type of grid. Don't be scattered and just messy. It's not wise and it can make you give you all sorts of problems so i just wrote, wrote the word grid make it like grid like okay so what you need to know is what is the central atom well here's the good news the first atom in the formula is 99 percent of the time usually let me just write usually but like really usually that is usually the central atom if it's the first atom in the formula um, the central atom, CTRL. There's a big exception, unless it's hydrogen. Like in H2O, hydrogen can never be the central atom, okay? Because it can't form two bonds. So the whole point, you can't be in the middle of any two things. So if it's hydrogen, that rule is off the table, but all pretty much the rest of the time, the, cent the first atom in your formula is the center atom. Um, let me make a couple other little points about this. Um, the central atom is usually the one that there's only one of. Central atom is usually the atom there's only one of. All right. Um, one last thing I want to say is that if you have multiple, like if you have a uh, string of atoms, like SCN in your Lewis structure, keep the order. Keep that order. Because likely it's written or named like that because that's the order that it appears in the molecule. So S to C to N. Don't just randomly do S and C. Um, and lastly, I'll say that the central atom, let me just write it right here. Central atom is usually the atom there's only one of. It's also usually the least electronegative atom. En, it's usually the least electronegative atom. Um, electronegativity we will learn about in the next video, so don't worry about that too much. It'll, you'll, it'll come back to be fully complete in a little bit. But now that I know, okay, fine, N is the central atom. Let me go ahead and do that step. It literally means write your central atom and arrange the other atoms around it. So as long as you do north, south, east, west, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to do like one here, one here, and one here. But I could have put him up top. That would have been totally fine as well. 
Now, moving on to step two. Um, step two is a mathematical thing. You want to count the total number of valence electrons in the molecule. Count the total number of valence electrons in the molecule. So this is a mathematical thing. And what I usually do is I usually do it right uh, next to the formula. So nitrogen has how many valence electrons go to your periodic table? It's in group five, so he has five. Fluorine, well, first of all, there are three fluorines. So whatever he has, I've got to multiply by three. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. So that's 21 plus five is 26. But here's the thing here. Count the total number of valence electrons in the molecule and divide by two to get the number of pairs. Remember I told you, in a molecule, okay, there's a couple exceptions to this. It's called free radicals or, or single electron species. You're not going to see anything on my test with a single electron species um, or free radicals. But what I'm about to say has one caveat, so don't take it to the bank. But the vast majority of molecules, um, all of the electrons are paired up, either as lone pairs, double dots, or as bonding pairs, dashes. So it's much easier, and I want you to, count electrons by pairs. In other words, get that number that there are 13 pairs of valence electrons in this molecule. That's how it's, I want you to do it. Now, step number three. Step number three says um, the next thing that you want to do. Notice, by the way, notice I'm not doing anything specific about nitrogen and drawing dots. I'm not bringing fluorine dots to the table. I'm I'm just following these me this methodology. Okay, it's a, it's it's like a it's like a top down way of doing a Lewis structure rather than kind of setting the table and looking for sharing. That's actually kind of hard when the molecules get harder. Step three: connect the atoms together. Um, let me do connect the atoms to the central atom, to be more specific, with single bonds, okay? With single bonds. So that means single bonds. Okay, don't get confused about that. So single, single, single. Now, why do I do single bonds? Well, I know there's at least single bonds there because if there wasn't, this molecule would be floating around. Like it, the fluorine would have flowed away. There's at least a single bond holding this molecule together. It could be a double bond, could be a triple bond. We will find out. But at the very least, I know there's that there. So that's why I put them there first. Step number four. After you connect the atoms together, you want to add your remaining pairs as lone pairs, LPs, but in a certain order. First, to the terminal atoms, and then to the central atom. And here's the whole concept here. Satisfying, in other words, making them happy, giving them either octets, if they're all other atoms except for hydrogen, or duets if they're hydrogen, satisfying the atoms as you move, as you go. Remember, the whole point of the molecule is that the reason it exists, the reason that it formed, is because it made all the atoms happy. Otherwise, it wouldn't have formed. So we're trying to figure out how does it exist. All right. We've used three pairs. We have 13 pairs that have to show up on this Lewis structure. That's a non-negotiable. You can't have more than 13. You cannot have less than 13. That's what you have to work with, and they all have to show up. We've used three of them. So now where do we add, start adding the other, the 10, the other 10? We're going to add the remaining pairs as lone pairs first to the terminal atoms. Terminal means not central. So we can, and pick anyone you want. Like I'm going to pick him, but I'm going to satisfy him and give him his octet through lone pairs. And then I'll move on to the next one. And I'm counting as I go. So I go like three, then I go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 
12. Okay, so first to the terminal atoms, so, but now the terminal atoms are all satisfied. They all got knocked out. But then to the central atom. So once I'm done with that, if I have any more, which I do, now I can put it on the central atom. Okay, now after step four, you're going to ask two questions. And this is really important because learning this in this method is going to help you understand much harder concepts like resonance and formal charge. It's, it's important to think this through very methodically. Here's your two questions that you have to ask after step four. Number one, did you use all your pairs? Did you use all your pairs? And you did. We used 13 pairs. That's a yes or no question. And if you were able to say yes, that's important. But that's not the only thing. The second question you have to ask is, is every atom satisfied? Do they all have an octet or a duet if it's hydrogen? That's also a yes or no question. When I look at this Lewis structure, he has eight. So an octet would be four pairs or eight. So I usually count by pairs, okay? So that's four pairs, that's in my mind, that's eight. Um, that's an octet, that's an octet, that's an octet. If you say yes to both of these, here's the important thing to understand, then you're done. Your Lewis structure is complete and you have a good Lewis structure. Okay, so that's when you know you're done. So with this NF3, this Lewis structure is done. It's important to know when to stop. We used all your pairs and every atom got satisfied, done. But sometimes you're not gonna be able to answer yes to both of those. So now I need to use a different molecule to illustrate this next point here. So I've erased step four, okay? But I want you to kind of make sure it's in your notes. Um, we're gonna end up adding a step five and, an, and a step six, but I can't really teach them with NF3 because that one was done. So let's move on to a new molecule. Get a little bit more practice. How about CO2, carbon dioxide? Let's see if we can learn something about this carbon dioxide molecule. You've learned its molar mass. You've learned, um, you know, that it's a gas and room temperature, all this stuff. But um, now let's think about what does it look like? Okay, what does this molecule look like? What kind of bonds are holding it together? Lewis theory is going to answer this question for us. So it's, it's a really neat thing. Let's follow our steps. Number one, arrange the atoms. Locate the central atom, and like I said, 99 times out of 100, it is the first atom listed. It's also one that only has, you only have one of it, and it is the least electronegative atom, which I know I haven't taught you yet, but you will see that soon. So carbon is in the middle, and just arrange the other atoms around it. Now, you could have put one on top, one on bottom, and done like a vertical thing. You frankly could have done one here and one here. I mean, most people don't but technically it's not wrong. So don't stress about whether they occupy the north, south, east, west positions. Um, if you can achieve some symmetry to make it look nice, then most people do that. Okay, arrange atoms on our paper. Step two, counting. Count the total number of valence electrons in the molecule. So carbon has four, oxygen has six, and there are two of them. So 12 plus four is 16. If I divide by two, that gives me eight pairs. Eight P is how I usually abbreviate it. That's how many pairs have to show up on my final Lewis structure, and that's how many I have to satisfy all the atoms. So step three, connect the atoms together. Okay. Step four, arrange the remaining pairs as lone pairs to the terminal atoms first. You can pick this one or this one, okay? Just start somewhere. So I'm just gonna pick this one and I'm gonna go ahead and satisfy him with lone pairs. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now it's time to ask the two questions because I just finished step four. Because here's the thing, you can't add pairs that don't exist. Once you hit eight pairs, you have to stop. You can't keep adding. That's a big no-no. You only have eight pairs and they all have been used. Did I use all my pairs? Yes. Second question, is every atom satisfied? Oxygen has an octet, carbon does not, which means my Lewis structure is not complete. And so I need to actually address step number five. 
if you um, run out of pairs, in other words, I'd like to add two more lone pairs in, on carbon to satisfy him. I don't have them. I can't invent them. They don't exist. So I've run out of pairs, essentially. What you need to do is you need to reassign, reassign. So you're going to have to erase, reassign um, your lone pairs. And you might have to do this several times, but we'll see, um, as bonding pairs to serve both atoms. All right, so let's show you what I mean by that. It's essentially just a reassignment. When I'm at this step and I see carbon's not happy, I'm going to say, guess what, oxygen? You're not going to get to have three sets of lone pairs. You're going to have to share. So I'm reassigning a lone pair, and I'm making it a bonding pair, a bonding pair. Um, and now, see, I'm still using the eight, but now I'm getting closer to satisfying carbon. Now, you can see I'm going to have to do it again to get him his octet. So I'll do it from the other side. And why did I pick the other oxygen? Well, symmetry is good. Nature likes symmetry usually, okay? So that's one thing. There is another concept here about formal charge and things that I have to, I'll have to teach later. But for now, just understand, go for the symmetry aspect and, you'll, and that'll be fine for now. But um, you can see that what I'm doing here is forming double bonds. Okay, so double bonds will end up being necessary for this molecule to answer yes to both questions. See, now I can say I used eight pairs and every atom is satisfied because by moving those oxygen, he still gets to keep them. Remember, they, they're, they're still shared. So he has eight, he has eight, and he has eight. All right, so that's CO2 and that's done. That is the molecule CO2. Carbon dioxide is held together by two double bonds. Alrighty, let's do another molecule. Um, let's do, how about NO plus? NO plus? Uh, I don't even know what that guy's name is, but it is a molecule that does exist. Now, let's do this one here. Um, same rules apply, use the methodology. Arrange the atoms on paper. Now, with this one, there's only two atoms. So there is no central atom. It's almost easy. Just put one right next to each other. Okay, if there's only two atoms, and that does happen, you'll have to draw Lewis structure sometimes for something that just has two atoms. Um, but don't, you know, it's easy. Just put them next to each other. Second step, total number of valence electrons. So here's where we got a little something different here. Nitrogen has five. And we're to that, we're going to add however many oxygen gives us. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Now, if you add those together, you're going to get 11. 11 is not divisible by two. That's another reason why I like people to, to count the number of pairs, because it will sometimes catch them making a little tiny mistake. Here's the issue. This is a cation, okay? It has a plus one charge. If it has a plus one charge, if you have a cation, what that's telling you is that you have lost electrons. Remember, the only way you get a charge is by the coming or going of electrons, okay? So a cation has lost electrons, and how many electrons has it lost? Well, if it has a plus one charge, it lost one electron. So whatever you get for your total, 11, you're going to have to subtract one for every positive charge. So this one only has 10 electrons, and still now we divide by two, and we get our five pairs. In the same way... Sometimes you'll have to add electrons if you have an anion. Um, so be careful of that. Charged polyatomic ions, which this is, you've got to make sure you adjust the number of electrons based on the charge. Five pairs of electrons, let's follow our rules. Step number three, connect the atoms together. Step number four, assign the remaining pairs as lone pairs to the terminal atoms first. I'm just going to pick either terminal atom and I'm satisfying him with lone pairs before I move on to the next one. So I'll just satisfy him, and then I'll, sat I'll, I'll work on satisfying him. But notice, at this point, I have run out of pairs. One, two, three, four, five. I can't add any more. So now it's time to reassign some pairs, who I now have as lone pairs. They're going to have to act 
as bonding pairs. They're going to have to serve both atoms, not just one. So you can just start erasing. So that lone pair will have to become a bonding pair. Okay, now is every atom satisfied? Oxygen is, nitrogen is not. So I will have to do it again. And that is how you would get a triple bond in this molecule, um, which it does have. Okay, that's the Lewis structure almost. This is a big deal. I've been making this point for months. Central to this species is its positive charge, and you cannot forget it on the Lewis structure. But anytime you have a charge and dots, you have to separate the two through a bracket. So um, uh, polyatomic ions, will, Lewis structures will always be enclosed in brackets. So this polyatomic ion has a triple bond. That's telling us something about the strength of the bond, and it, we'll learn um, more about this with Chapter 10 as well. But that's how you would do this molecule. And we have only one more to go before the end of this video. We're almost done. ICL4 minus. ICL4 minus, another polyatomic ion, one that we don't haven't encountered yet. Let's do this according to our methodology. Okay, so I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to start working on it, and you work on it too. Alrighty, so I just completed step number four, where I satisfied the terminal atoms with lone pairs, okay? And as I'm doing my accounting, I have used four pairs for bonds, and then five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I've used 16 pairs. So now the, the two questions, have I used all my pairs? Well, this time the answer is no. I have 18 pairs that have to show up on my Lewis structure. But it feels funny because every atom has an octet. Okay, but you can't, you're not done until you can answer yes to both of those questions. So it seems that everybody's satisfied, but you didn't use all your pairs, so you're not done. This is where step number six comes in. Step number six says if you have extra pairs, kind of like when you seem to have satisfied every atom, you are going to add them as lone pairs to the central atom. Now, let me do a comma here. I'm going to complete this sentence in a minute here. So our last two pairs will get added to the central atom, and you're going to put them on like a little diagonal, somewhere on like a diagonal position. You could put them like here, or you could put them here as well. It doesn't matter, but somewhere on that little diagonal position. is that That's how you would draw that Lewis structure. Now let's make sure it's perfect though. That negative charge um, needs to show up whoops, on your Lewis structure outside of the brackets. So make sure you, you, you write that in there. That's the correct Lewis structure. But let me finish my sentence. If you have extra pairs, add them as lone pairs to the central atom, which will give it what's called an expanded octet. Expanded octet, in other words, it has more than eight. Now, an expanded octet is fine. And um, it is um, stable for atoms as long as you are in third period and below on your periodic table. 
So as long as your atom that you are adding them to is on the third period and below, so the third period is sodium's period, um, those atoms, so things like phosphorus, uh, whereas phosphorus, sulfur, is fairly common to have an expanded octet, and anything below can tolerate, and not only tolerate, but be satisfied with an expanded octet. So you'll notice iodine is um, in that lower part of the periodic table. You will never have something like carbon or nitrogen or oxygen with an expanded octet ever. It has to do with the fact that they have d orbitals nearby to tolerate the extra electrons. Um, but just know that um, that is why it's okay. Now, in some ways, you don't really have to overthink it. If you just follow the steps and you get to that point, you know you're going to have extra electrons on there and you just put them on. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, and I think I'll close with this, there is uh, something um, called an incomplete octet. So you have expanded octets. And then let me just mention this one exception here. There's one more exception to the octet rule. Well, okay, I just mentioned the expanded octet, which, which happens. And you'll know when you need them just based on whether you follow these rules or not. You'll, you'll kind of know you have to add them there, so it's not too hard to figure it out. The expanded octet is the one, the third period or below. There's a second exception, which I want to mention here, which is called an incomplete octet. That means having less than eight, less than eight electrons and still happy or still satisfied. Okay, what are the two atoms that do that? It's just something you have to kind of memorize. Boron and beryllium. Boron and beryllium are happy with less than, um, less than an expanded octet. Or sorry, less than an octet. Let me go ahead and show you real quick. Um, the examples are BF3 and BEF2. These are, these are famous molecules. Let me quickly just draw their Lewis structures for you. I'm, I'm going to real quick draw it. Um, just using our rules, using our methodology. Boron in the middle. Fluorine's on the side. Count the number of pairs. Boron has um, three. Fluorine has seven, but there's three of them, so 21. That's 24 divided by two, 12 pairs. Connect them together. Lone pairs to the terminals. All right. So when we get to this point, we've used all 12 pairs. And normally you'd say, whoa, every atom's not satisfied. Boron, it doesn't look satisfied. Maybe I need to relocate and add a double bond. But here's what you have to remember. Boron is satisfied with an incomplete octet. The requirement was that you were satisfied by using all your pairs. So we have used 12 and boron is satisfied. In fact, boron is happy, if you want to make a note, with three pairs of electrons, which is what he has. So this Lewis structure is done. That's the whole point of this incomplete octet. We don't change it at all. BEF2, real quick, and then we're done. Just making a quick Lewis structure. So beryllium has two valence electrons. F2 would be 14 because they each have seven. That's 16 divided by two, eight pairs. Connect together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So once again, remember when we when it was CO2, we said it's not satisfied. We had to make double bonds, and that was true. But you have to remember in your mind, beryllium and boron are special. They're happy with an incomplete octet. Beryllium um, himself, he is happy, happiest with two pairs. So this Lewis structure is done as is because you used all eight pairs and every atom actually is satisfied. So that's what it means to be an incomplete octet. That's not a choice for you to apply to carbon or nitrogen or oxygen. This is bor boron and beryllium only. It's exceptions. So those are two exceptions to 
um, drawing Lewis structures that you want to kind of keep in mind. Now, you want to practice this. There are a myriad of examples in your textbook. In the back of the book, I've assigned some with your homework problems. Anything you can find, draw a Lewis structure for any kind of simple molecule. Um, you can use the internet. Like I said, use your textbook. There's lots of examples to practice. But you want to get good at drawing Lewis structures, and I am going to require you to do this methodology the same way that I do it. And um, on the test. So so practice it. Don't kind of don't kind of do your own thing because part of what I'm grading you on is that you're doing it the right way. Because I know the right way will lead you to the right answers in the future, even beyond this test. All right. Thank you for your attention. That's the end of this video. Hopefully it was helpful and the next one hopefully will be shorter.